Welcome to Israel In Depth, where scholars and experts come to discuss topics about Israel in depth. You're listening to a podcast by the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Professor of Israel Studies at UCLA. Joining me for this episode of Israel In Depth is Avanel Ampat. He's the Morris Greenberg Professor of Holocaust Studies at New York University. Previously, he was the Doris and Simon Conover Chair of Judaic Studies and the Director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life at the University of Connecticut. And before that, he was the Philip Feltman Professor of Modern Jewish History at the University of Hartford, where he served as the Director of the Museum of Jewish Civilization. He was also the Miles Lerman Applied Research Scholar for Jewish Life and Culture at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Professor Pat earned his BA from Emory University and his PhD from NYU. He's the author and editor of numerous books on the Holocaust. His books include Finding Home and Homeland, Jewish Youth and Zionism in the Aftermath of the Holocaust, published in 2009, an edited volume on Jewish displaced persons titled We Are Here, New Approaches to the Study of Jewish Displaced Persons in Postwar Germany, published in 2010, a book co-edited with David Slutke and Gabriella Fe Gabrielle Feinberg Finder called Laughter After, Humor in the Holocaust, a co-edited volume with Laura Hilton, Understanding and Teaching the Holocaust, and a book on the early post-war memory of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, The Jewish Heroes of Warsaw, The Afterlife of the Revolt, published in 2021. There was a finalist for the Yad Vashem International Book Prize. His latest book, Israel and the Holocaust, has just been published by Bloomsbury Press as part of its perspective on the Holocaust series. So we're recording this episode of Israel in Depth on Friday, May the 3rd. In a couple of days, beginning on the evening of Sunday, May 5th, through Monday, May 6th, is Holocaust Remembrance Day, called Yom HaShoah. This is when the state of Israel and Jews around the world commemorate the victims of the Holocaust, the Shoah. So I've asked Dr. Pat to join me on Israel in Depth to talk about the relationship between Israel and the Holocaust and how we commemorate it and look back and think about it. So welcome to Israel in Depth and thank you for joining me, Dr. Pat. Thank you so much for having me here for this conversation today, Dov. It's a pleasure. So first of all, I think maybe it would be helpful if you could just tell uh, the audience a little bit about Yom HaShoah, about Holocaust uh, Memorial Day. Uh, when was it established? How was it established? By whom? Why was this specific date? Obviously, we're talking about the English date. It's according to the Hebrew calendar. Why was that date chosen? And maybe if you could talk a bit about how Israelis observe Yom HaShoah. Sure. Um, so uh, it, it's a it's a good place to for us to start, especially considering our our point on the calendar. Um, so the date for Yom HaShoah or or Yom HaShoah Hagvura, the day of uh, destruction and of heroism um, or bravery, uh, was was established by Israel's Knesset originally in in 1951, and then it's codified in a series of subsequent laws um, and amendments. The present state of the way in which it is commemorated is a law that's passed in 1959. But the date itself, as you alluded to, is, is a date that's connected to the uh, Jewish calendar. It's on the 27th of the month of Nisan. Um, and there's an interesting debate that uh, is uh, uh, debated in the early years of the state, or actually in the aftermath of the war, as to what would be the proper date to commemorate the day of the destruction of European Jewry. There are already a number of dates that existed on the Jewish calendar, uh, the 10th of Tevet, the 17th of Tammuz, the 9th of Av, days to commemorate destruction. But it was noted that it would be appropriate to have a separate date to commemorate Yom HaShoah, the destruction of European Jewry. The original date, and this is something that I talk about in the book on the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising as well, the original date that was proposed was uh, the date that would correspond with the beginning of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which on the Gregorian calendar is April 19th, um, which the Bundists sort of said this is a holy date, the April 19th. But on the Jewish calendar, uh, it was a problem because this date corresponded with the first night of Passover. And so uh, making it the 14th of Nisan would have been a, a little bit of a conflict on the Jewish calendar. And so it was decided that the date would be the 27th of Nisan, um, which would be about two weeks later after Passover was over, 
um, but still why the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was taking place. And we can talk about why it was important that uh, the day of destruction, the Yom HaShoah, be one that would correspond with a day of heroism, uh, Yom, uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. An interesting note on the calendar that is important to point out is that in effect, by doing this, having Yom HaShoah on the 27th of Nisan, it situated this date in a cycle that would take place one week on the Israeli calendar, one week before Yom HaZikaron, and uh, in that sense, one week then before Yom HaTzma'ut, which takes place the next date. So it sort of creates the cycle of destruction and commemoration of destruction, Shoah, and then Tikuma, right, rebirth on on the calendar in a cycle that takes place on a yearly basis now, going from the week from Yom HaShoah to Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaTzma'ut. So that kind of indicates in a way that decision, I mean, presumably that was a deliberate decision to situate it in this cycle, the connection between how Israelis commemorate the Holocaust and even think about the Holocaust and Israel itself and Zionism. Whereas of course, the International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which I believe is in January, occurs on the day of the liberation of Auschwitz. Is that correct? Um, yes. It's quite an interesting kind of juxtaposition to think about just the 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 fact that these different dates were chosen and how they and what they communicate through choosing these specific dates in the calendar. In the case of one about the liberation of a kind of more universalized perhaps message of Holocaust remembrance versus how Israelis think about it, which is as you as you know kind of intimately tied to the creation of the state of Israel and its justification. Yes, I think um, it's it's interesting. I do this exercise with my students, you know, to think about sort of what are the dates and what are our associations with those dates, and how do we create collective memory based on sort of putting these dates on the calendar. And so, yes, exactly as you've pointed out, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which uh, the United Nations sort of uh, codifies, I think it's in two thousand five, by making it January twenty seventh the date of the liberation of Auschwitz. It conveys a very specific message that is associated with a memory that has to do with liberation, but also uh, the Soviet forces liberating Auschwitz, sort of, uh, in a sense, uh, redeeming and liberating a helpless people there has one connotation that might be sort of a more universalized message um, versus, as you've suggested, uh, Yom HaShoah, which is very specifically put on the calendar in the cycle between uh, re remembering the destruction of European Jewry and then the um, creation of the state of Israel taking place one week later. And very importantly, having this notion of Yom HaShoah vehagvua, right? So it's not just about destruction, but it's about bravery. It's about heroism. And of course, and I say, of course, italicized or in quotation marks, it has to take place in correspondence with the timing of the revolt, um, in this case, the, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And what's important to note also is this April 19th date in the aftermath of the war. So April 19th, 1948, for example, is the date that the Rappaport Monument, um, that is the monument to the ghetto fighters in Warsaw, is dedicated on the five-year anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. April 19th, 1951 is the date um, eight years later that the monument, the statue to Mordechai and Alevich at Kibbutz Yad Mordechai is dedicated, right? So there is great significance to this um, Gregorian date of April 19th. So it, it's sort of balancing this idea of this is clearly the date on which Jews should in the um, the opinion of the of the Zionist movement and the state of Israel, this is the date that if we are to remember anything, this is what we want to remember, and this is what we choose to remember, and this is the date we should use for our association um, to the memory of the Shoah, knowing that it could have been any day, any day could have been chosen. I mean, it it is striking. Then there's this. It kind of indicates there's the the this dissonance in the in a in a way or a difference between how the international community commemorates, memorializes the Holocaust and thinks about Jews as victims in that uh, related to Auschwitz versus the Israeli uh, Jewish and uh, understanding which focuses also on Jewish resistance and the message of resistance. So one, on the one hand, we have a kind of, you know, essentially a depiction, a presentation of Jews as victims, whereas the Israeli commemoration also emphasizes Jewish heroism and, and action. I wonder, 
is that, you know, it's, it's, it's even within Israel, though, you know, now it's just referred to and around the Jewish world as Yom HaShoah. Has that second meaning of Jewish resistance, you know, related to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, that was so important in the state's commemoration of the Holocaust in the early years, really focusing on resistance. Is that has that remained a important component of how Israelis think about and memorialize the Holocaust, or has over time, just as the the, the word itself, the name itself, has been kind of abbreviated now to just Yom HaShoah? Um, has that also does that also reflect a kind of shift in the way that Israelis? think about the Holocaust as moving away from this emphasis upon, you know, the Warsaw Ghetto and the uprising and, and heroism and uh, resistance? Yeah, this is a, an excellent question, Dove. And I think um, you're really getting at something crucial uh, in in the way that you frame the question, which is what happens to the Gvula, right? Or or how is the, the memory of heroism and bravery remembered? And one of the interesting things that um, in the in the book on the history of Israel's relationship to the Holocaust, which is essentially what the book looks at, sort of collective memory of the Holocaust within Israeli society and how that's changed over time and what that can tell us about the self-conception, if as we can say that, of a nation as a self. Um, one of the interesting things is to see sort of the the place that survivors um, have assumed within the memory of the Holocaust. And so in the early years of the state, 100%, the idea is to elevate and put the, um, the, the heroes, in this case, the ghetto fighters, the partisans, those who participate in an active resistance on a pedestal as the ones that should be remembered. And almost everyone else is is not on that level, not on that pedestal, and almost there's a sense of of shame, or this is the intent, I think, associated with well, then how did you survive if you were not one of those people who was fighting back? And one of the things that that I look at in the book is how that changes over time. So, in the 1950s, for sure, this is very pronounced. This is very prominent. So you have certain um, heroic figures like uh, Tzivi Lebetkin or Antek Zuckerman um, from the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, who play a key role in creating the Ghetto Fighters House um, near Akko in the north of Israel, or an Abba Kovner, who's prominent with the partisans. These are very prominent figures who testify at the Eichmann trial. But one of the interesting things that happens actually at the Eichmann trial is you start to see many more sort of stories and experiences of survival that go well beyond the idea of armed resistance and heroic fighting back and broaden the experience of what it might have been like to uh, survive the war, to live through that. And you see a broader sense of identification with that broader scope of experiences uh, uh, during the war. Um, and so it's quite interesting. And you know, to your point about sort of dropping the gvura at the end of the name, you do see a broader identification with a wide range of experiences, which let's face it, by, by 1960, there's something like 500,000 survivors who end up um, in Israel. And the vast majority of them are not participants in, um, you know, ghetto revolts or armed revolts in camps or in the partisans, right? It's a broad range of experiences. And so we have seen over time a much wider identification with a broad range of experiences during the war. Have we also seen a shift in understanding of what resistance looks like? That resistance doesn't only entail armed resistance, but also, you know, quotidian acts of, of you know, resistance of keeping an artwork, maintaining something, telling a story. Uh, is, is, is there a shift in, in the ways in which it's understood, not just between this kind of breaking down of this dichotomy between victims and fighters, um, on heroes and victims, but also a, a broader understanding that resistance itself isn't only through military force. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it's it's quite interesting to see sort of the role that in particular Israeli scholars, and, and here I'm thinking like a Yehuda Bauer or Israel Gutman or uh, Dalia Ofer or Dina Parat, the, the, the scholars that have developed in the Israeli academy who have very specifically pushed back against this idea of sort of a, a ideologically defined notion of resistance only being a form of armed resistance. And Yehuda Bauer in particular is very well known for this for framing of Amida, the idea of standing up against as a type of resistance, a type of defiance 
any organized group activity that basically set to defy Nazi edict. And so this much broader definition of resistance that could encompass um, types of smuggling food into the ghetto or organizing soup kitchens or educating the youth or documentation projects like Ringelblum, which uh, have also been part of a much broader expansion of the research that the field of Holocaust studies has now undertaken into the broader spectrum of Jewish responses. But for years, in the early years of the state in particular, there was such a focus on just armed resistance. And now in the last decades, there's been a much broader approach to looking at the wide range of Jewish experiences during the war. So that, that's that been a really interesting kind of scholarly shift in terms of how scholars write about it and what they're looking at and, and, and who they choose to focus on. Has that, I wonder, filtered down into the Israeli public consciousness in terms of how, you know, ordinary Israelis think about the Holocaust? Have they also enlarged their understanding of what, it, of what resistance looks like and of, um, you know, the role of, of force within that? Yeah, yeah, I think yes, I think the short answer is that yes, you know, we we and and it's quite interesting to think about sort of um the ways in which uh the Holocaust is taught, the way in which the, the Shoah is taught, um the broader sort of sense of of and you can see this, you know, first the Eichmann trial is obviously a key turning point where you start to see many many different stories of survival that are presented in the Eichmann trial, but you also start to see sort of broader sense of education and and reading and um, stories that are written uh, about about this wide range of experiences. And and so this is something that we've seen, you know, in particular since the 1980s, 1990s, an identification with. Uh, a much broader sense of of Jewish victim experiences at the same time, right? One of the things that we're seeing, and uh, you know, I'm thinking about um the present moment that we're in, right? Sort of thinking about um as we've seen sort of this deepening identification. And I should say that in the early years of the state, right, there was a, a reluctance, and I think Ben Gurion was very sensitive to this, a reluctance to make the Shoah the sort of keystone foundational principle, right? Like this is not the reason that the state of Israel exists. And there was a lot of concern about, you know, there are, uh, the whole uh, Declaration of Independence lists all the different reasons that the state of Israel should exist. The land of Israel is the birthplace of the Jewish people and where the Jewish people gave the world the Bible, et cetera, right? So that this should not be the reason. And yet in the most recent decades, we've seen a much deeper identification with the memory of the Shoahs as one of the reasons to help explain the need for the state. And that has also been part and parcel with a deeper identification of the wide range of Jewish experiences that, and I just, I want to point out, because it'd be very easy to say, okay, this is politicians and sort of using the memory of the Holocaust, but this is a worldwide phenomenon, right? So since the 80s, and in particular the 1990s, we've seen a deepening identification with the memory of the Shoah um, in the United States as well. You know, 73% of American Jews say remembering the Holocaust is essential to their Jewish identity. 65% of Israeli Jews say the same thing, right? So um, it's not just something that it's takes place in Israel. Time. It's right. Yeah. Um, so I want to. So you mentioned the the pivotal role that the Eichmann trial uh, played in in shifting uh, Israelis' understanding of the Holocaust, their view of 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 the victims of it, and and their awareness really about the experiences of Jews during the Holocaust. Um, are there other events, kind of watershed moments, you know, um, in in this growing identification? It seems to me from from the Eichmann trial in. in to October the 7th, in some ways, is like the apogee of that of that shift, where not only are Israelis somehow becoming more identified, but there's this notion of them as almost in, in suffering, you know, the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. The, re, the re, referring to it, to what happened on October the 7th as pogroms. Um, is that you know? Can you kind of can narrate a little bit of some of these pivotal moments as you see it in 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 forging this ever closer identification? It seems between Israeli Jews and 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 the and the memory of the Holocaust and the victims of it. Yeah, I think I think one of the interesting things that I found in in the work on this book, and I, and I have to say that the book itself, Israel and the Holocaust. It is in many respects, um, you know, you might remember that about 30 years ago, 
Tom Segev uh, published his book, The Seventh Million, Israelis in the Holocaust. And since then, um, there's been just a fascinating development of historical research on uh, the history of the the relationship, Israeli relationship to the Holocaust that has developed in the past three decades. And one of the things that's been made clear in this research is that there was this idea that there was a silence, right? That, um, you know, uh, nobody talked about the Holocaust and survivors were discouraged. But what all that research has, has laid to rest is what we might call the myth of silence, right? That um, there was discussion of the memory of the Holocaust from day one within Israeli society. There was, um, so there were legal trials that were taking place over the course of the 1950s. You know, one of the most famous is uh, the the Kastner affair, um, in which he was suing Malkiel Grunwald for, um, you know, uh, defamation. Um, and so this was a, a high profile affair in the 1950s where there was great deal of public discussion. Um, the the debate over the reparations in 1951, 1952, in, intense public discussion. Um, you know, the the uh, publications of, of texts that were being published in the 1950s, I'm thinking of the fiction, for example, of Katsetnik, uh, Yechiel Dinur, in the 1950s, the popularity in the Yiddish press of accounts. Uh, all of this was taking place in the 1950s, memorial services. So one of the interesting things is that yes, the Eichmann trial is a is a watershed moment in terms of sort of the way that the state, um, you know, addressed the memory of the Holocaust, giving a, a, a platform for 108 survivors to share witness testimony, opening up a much broader platform, recording them, publicizing to the world, creating television in Israel, which didn't exist until then. Um, you know, so all of these things are taking place even before the Eichmann trial in an interesting, interesting way. What is fascinating, I think, to see is how after the Eichmann trial, you do see this deepening identification, but I think that there was a foundation already for it there amongst survivors themselves, amongst survivor families, and, you know, not to take away from the idea that there was a reluctance to talk about it. There was still a shame, but I think the foundation was there on the grassroots level. And there was perhaps a tension always between how the state related to it from a top-down level and how broader society and the large population of survivors related to it on the grassroots level. And what we've seen over the last 50, 60 years is that coming together of the state essentially sort of adopting uh, the place that a lot of uh, the broader society um, had been. What I'll say is, is quite interesting and in what you're alluding to in terms of where we are today with October 7th is the ways in which over the last, I would say, three decades, um, in particular since the 1990s, we have seen um, a much greater politicization of the memory of the Holocaust, much more comfort in using it in as a political weapon, as a, a sort of um, you know a, a a name to call someone like using this term Nazi. Um, we're seeing um, a lot of pushback in the realm of humor. There's a dark comedy that uh, that revolves around um, sort of invocations that is also pays sensitivity to the notion that the Holocaust and memory of the Holocaust is being trivialized in political circles, and so. What we don't see is any sort of questioning about, you know, whether or not this should be a central component of right. Israeli's national collective identity. It's just about how it should be used and what are the proper ways that it should be should be I, used. I think of, you know, I remember there was a book about maybe a decade ago by the uh, uh, former Labour Party uh, member and speaker of the Knesset Avon Board, Avon Book, who yeah. did challenge that. And you occasionally get people saying, you know, the Holocaust has taken on an, an outsized role in the Israeli public. And then it, it, it uh, that Israeli Jews at least overly identify with the victims. And they're not recognizing, for example, that Israel is a powerful state. And it, you know, Jews today are not in the same position as Jews during the Holocaust. And we've seen this even in, I think, reactions in some of the debate after October the 7th, is that, you know, is there too much identification in a sense, in, you know, forgetting the fact that, you know, the position of Jews uh, in Israel is, is quite different than the position right. of Jews in Nazi-occupied Europe. 
And and I think, you know, so Avram Borg, it's, it's so interesting, right? And I think in English, uh, the book was called The Holocaust is Over, Let Us Rise from Its Ashes or something. Yes. And, and I talk about it in the book. And, you know, it, what what's so interesting is it is essentially it goes back to this um, almost classical Zionist or labor Zionist sort of approach, right? That let us let us not make this the sort of foundational principle for the existence of the state. And there is a tension from the early years of the state of how should the state relate to the memory of the Holocaust, right? Does it a sense, on the one hand, you have this idea that, you know, the state of Israel should exist and you have to negate the diaspora, but then the Holocaust represents sort of the ultimate negation of the diaspora. And what's, you know, Avram Borg and and that sort of idea that's expressed, which is a is a very important viewpoint, right? That the notion that um, let's be careful about how much we justify the existence of the state with reference to the memory of the Shoah, because it will basically give in to this idea that the Jewish people are forever persecuted. And it's very hard to say this in the present moment where we have sort of rising anti-Semitism in the aftermath of October 7th. But it's a very pessimistic view of Jewish history and a pessimistic view of the Jewish future, right? That this will never end. And I think what Borg was essentially saying is we have to be optimistic, right? We have to think about the potential for productive relations with our neighbors and with the rest of the world. And yet, since first intifada and then especially in the second intifada and now in october 7th the tendency has been to frame israel's relationships with the rest of the world through this prism of the of the memory of the holocaust and that has profound implications um what what i set out to do is is in this book is not to sort of as an academic put a thumb on the scale one way or the other but just to say let's be aware of how this has unfolded over time and what the implications of, of this might be. Right, and it, it's striking that I think the two Israeli leaders who have done the most to, you know, put the, make the Holocaust really central in Israeli public discourse and understanding is probably Menachem Begin um, and Benjamin Netanyahu. I mean, both of them, in, in, in even in their, you know, um, in their diplomacy to the world and the, way, the messages that they present to the world, the Holocaust features features very very prominently, right? And it's you know it's it's certainly so you know when Begin comes to power in 1977, and and one of the striking things is I was looking at his speech that he gave at the at the White House upon receiving the Nobel Peace Prize in 19. 19- uh, you know, to, in 1979, or when he received the Peace Prize in 1979 for making peace with Egypt. And even there, he invoked um, the memory of the Holocaust, right? To essentially say that I I am a child of, of Europe. I'm, a, you know, sort of to remember, because it was such a core part of his identity and his family's Not experiences. Life experience, of course. I mean, he himself, uh, you know, he lost family, met direct family members. Exactly. Life. Um, and he had to right. So and 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 it's the same um, Menachem Begin who, in 1951, was leading demonstrations against the reparations agreement. Right, like let us not accept blood money. Right, we that we have to erase the shame of taking this um, money. Money will never compensate for the lives that were lost. Right, and and certainly yes, Netanyahu. Um, if if Begin, as Segev writes about, you know, writes this in the seventh million that Begin was the great popularizer of the of the memory of the Holocaust, or he was the one who most politicized it. Netanyahu is one hundred percent continued in that tradition, but it also gives us a sense of, and a very important understanding of a worldview, right? That um, the state of Israel has to exist um, because. Anti-Semitism will never disappear. The Jewish people are always um, going to be persecuted. We're always, uh, the Jewish people, the state of Israel will always be at battle with its enemies. And so what you can even see, like in Netanyahu, when he would give these um, Yom HaShoah addresses, uh, you know, invoking the specter of a nuclear-armed Iran as another Holocaust, right? And that the memory of the Shoah essentially commands us to not allow that to happen, yeah, right? So, exactly. And it's been striking just in over in recent months, you know, I was thinking about how 
some of the discourse about, you know, uh, Yahya Sinwar, the, the leader of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, you know, echoed the Begin talking about Arafat being Hitler in his bunker in Beirut in 1982. And now it's Yahya Sinwar and the tunnels under Gaza. And, 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 and in both cases, they are kind of talked about in some ways as uh, new Hitlers, as, as people right. who's, so there's, there's these echoes uh, of the past in, in, their, in their language uh, between Begin and for all the other differences, um, between Begin and Netanyahu, and it does, I think, indicate, as you say, how particularly the Israeli right um, sees it versus maybe the more ambivalence, like you were saying, among the left on the Labour because of this desire to create the new Jew and right. to separate Jewish history, uh, is Zionist history or Israeli history from Jewish history rather than right. continuation of it. And and so what's interesting about that idea of separating <laughs> separating Zionist history from Jewish history is that as that distance has been shortened or erased, right, where this idea that um, the state of Israel, you know, I'm thinking about uh, Yutka and the Chaim Chazaz story, the notion that, you know, what do we need to learn that history for? We can transcend that history. Just, you know, let me skip over these 1800 years of diaspora history. As that distance has been erased, I think in very important ways, and Israel has been returned to the broader scope of Jewish history, we can see at the same time this deeper identification with the suffering of um, you know, Jews in Europe during the war, this notion that you see expressed by different ministers, you know, but for the grace of God, we would have been there as well. This deeper identification that is associated with, the, for example, the trips to Poland, right? That I too could have been there, right? It's just an accident of birth that I was not, right? These sorts of things that you see expressed um, does sort of go together with the deeper identification. I do I do want to mention, and I think it's important, to, October 7th, um, yes, we've seen this in a lot of ways. And one of the things that I'm paying a lot of attention to, and, and I'll just mention the book, you know, uh, for better or for worse, the, the book was done by October. And it, I had the final page proofs on October 9th, and I really couldn't change anything aside from adding a few lines here and there. But what I'm looking at and paying a, a great deal of attention to now is how October 7th, or let's say how the memorial frameworks that are already in existence within Israel for how the Shoah should be remembered, for how the Shoah should be commemorated, how they might be employed um, for memorializing and remembering October 7th. And so that will, in effect, have, um, it will shape the way in which this event is remembered. Um, and, the, you know, let's, let's, there are certain parallels and there are certain analogies and we can, you know, discuss those about the horrific events that took place and um, the atrocities that were perpetrated. They're totally different historical events in the sense of October 7th, 2023 is not 1943, right? La Hav deal. But what's interesting- People see this connection. People see the connection there. Um, and what's striking to me in a way is that if you're thinking about how October the 7th may change understandings and memorialization of the Holocaust, it also interrupts or challenges or undermines potentially this reading of the Holocaust this is the way in which this, the, the Holocaust has been commemorated in Israel, this notion from, from the show, from destruction to rebirth, right, to the establishment of the state, the notion of never again. O October, the, 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 the very vulnerability that Israelis, uh, particularly in the South, experienced this the sense that the state wasn't there, the IDF wasn't there. And I don't want to kind of just move us away too far from the topic, but in some ways it, it actually challenges this notion of the difference now is that we now have a state, right? The, the, right. the, 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 the narrative arc is from victimhood to statehood, from weakness to strength. Um, and in a sense, the October 7th fundamentally could be seen to challenge that that narrative arc, if you like, by saying actually Israeli Jews were being, you know, Jews are still being brutalized in their own homes and, and carried away despite having a state, despite having right. the most powerful army in the region. Right. And so, I mean, this is, you know, it, it's fascinating to consider. It's, I think one of the things that, that we'll have to pay attention to is, 
on the one hand, right, how this event, as you've as you suggested, sort of pierces this notion, this aura of invulnerability and and does render sort of the idea that the state can't protect its citizens, that the very use of a term like pogrom, which by definition, you know, in sort of the Russian context would imply that um, either the, the army and the police either did nothing to um, help uh, the vulnerable uh, Jewish subjects in the Russian empire or were complicit right? You can decide which one, right? So we just have to be very careful to the terms that we use and what the implications of that uh, might mean. And I'll say, and I don't know, I mean, people are going to have to do research on this in the future, right? The nature of the atrocities that were perpetrated on October 7th, was there some component of it to, as you as you noted, pierce the aura of, of invincibility, to show that Jews are vulnerable, to um, sort of... Uh, Pierce this notion that, that uh, trauma, in a sense, to actually activate the exactly trauma. to relive the trauma of the Shoah, right? I, I don't know. I mean, Sinwar knows a lot about the Israeli mindset, and and so that's one thing. And then the other thing is, in terms of the response to October seventh, on the one hand, I suspect that this will continue a deepening identification with the memory of the Holocaust, and it might change it in certain ways. Um, will be interesting to pay attention to. And the other is the state will need to reassert its power um, and to reassure its citizenry that it can protect them against external threats, that they are not vulnerable. And, and that hasn't been accomplished. You know, people still feel vulnerable. They have lost trust in state authorities, et cetera. But right through this framework might help us to understand um, how this will govern uh, these types of responses. Absolutely. Now, I, 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 we've, we're, we've passed time, but I can't. I have to ask you a couple more questions. I hope you don't sure. mind, because I'm, I'm very curious as well. I mean, we're here outside of Israel. Um, you direct a uh, Jewish study center. How do we think about the difference between the way Jews outside of Israel, um, in the diaspora, are thinking about? I mean. It seems that Jews outside of Israel have adopted Yom HaShoah rather than more than International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Is there a difference between the ways in which, or have Jews, as, as you can see, it kind of adopted the dominant Israeli way of memorializing and thinking about it? Or is there a disconnect or any sort of dissonance between how, you know, outside of Israel we memorialize, we think about the Holocaust and how Jews inside Israel do? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think, um, especially as we have Yom HaShoah coming up, that I don't know, I'll be honest with you, I don't know to what extent um, people are aware, <laughs> right, of of the why, right? Why this date? Why not another date? Um, one of the things that uh, in in a previous book on the, on the afterlife of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising that was interesting to find is that even during the war, um, Jews in different parts of the world already began to interpret the meaning of the revolt or the meaning of the Holocaust through pre-existing political frameworks. Mm -hmm. And so I suspect that this might have continued and and you know might influence the way in which Jews in America, for example, um, remember the Shoah in a way that on the one hand, yes, uh, sort of justifies the need for the existence of the state of Israel, but at the same time, um, also helps them to understand their position uh, within the United States. And I think in a way that's quite interesting, and we're seeing this in the American context, this discussion of sort of alarm, surprise, shock at rising levels of anti-Semitism. What does this mean? Is this the quote unquote end of the golden age? And I know that's not the point of our conversation today. We could debate that at some other point, but what, what I think will be interesting to see on the part of American Jews is, you know, does the way in which the Shoah has remembered uh, change over time? We've seen, and, you know, this is something I happen to be interested in in another context, like directing a Center for the Study of Anti-Semitism. I'm very interested in how do we educate about anti-Semitism? How much are we... education actually prevent... Uh, precisely, precisely, yeah. right? How do we use Holocaust? Are we, are we teaching about the Holocaust for the right reasons? Um, in this country... It's been uh, framed as, you know, oh, we have rising levels of anti-Semitism. Let's teach young people the about the Holocaust. When a celebrity and makes some uh, anti-Semitic remark, uh, somebody says- Send them to a museum. Yeah. Yes. 
Exactly. And, um, you know, as, as the comedian, uh, Modi Rosenfeld points out, right? Like that's probably the last thing you should do with somebody who, who, you know, don't show them to send them to a place where it's a how to guide. Um, so, but, but I think, you know, it, it raises these important questions of, of sort of why are we teaching it? How are we teaching it? And, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, uh, you know, what, what, uh, the present moment sort of outside of Israel, what I'll say though, in terms of your original question, it, it, I think it is important for, to sort of step back and remind people, okay, this is why the international community marked January 27th. This is why the state of Israel has Yom HaShoah V'Hagvura, right? And, and what I'll say, what's interesting also is, you know, are we doing this in a secular political context? Are we doing this in a religious context? Are we doing this in a cultural context? Or, you know, how, what shape do these commemorations take? So, you know, uh, however yeah. one wants to do it. Yeah. That could be the subject of your next book is looking at this uh, in, on, in the diaspora, in the Jewish diaspora, and they're shifting, especially given the fact that the ways in which diaspora Jews have, have, learned about the Holocaust has often been through and meeting with survivors. And of course, this is now really the last generation of survivors. And that's going to completely change how we commemorate and memorialize the Holocaust in the future when the right. survivors are no longer there to provide direct testimony in the way I think has been so important in in uh, bringing particularly young people to to hear about what, what happened. Uh, so yeah. not more to... Uh, to, to write about in the future. Um, and I really, I mean, we could continue this conversation. I've really enjoyed the conversation. It's been fascinating. I'm very grateful for you to, to join me today. Um, so thank you uh, so much. I wanna remind uh, all the audience that the book, Israel and the Holocaust is uh, available, published by Bloomsbury Press. This just gave you hopefully a, a small taste of how rich uh, the book is. Uh, so go out and get a copy. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Pat for joining me on Israel In Depth. I want to thank again all my listeners for joining us. This has been an episode of Israel In Depth produced by the UCLA Mazarian Center for Israel Studies. Thank you all for listening.